Relationships are great, but have you ever experienced a relationship? Relationships go beyond just a connection with another person. They translate to partnerships with the people that are involved in our everyday lives, the people that we do life with. In this series, we'll talk about not just how to improve the relationships we are in, but to select the right relationships to be in. Welcome to Relationships. Funny. Every time I get up here to speak, we do such an awesome, fun piece. Was that not great, yeah. love? But we're in our last week, our final week of relationships. How many of you have loved this series? Yeah. Hasn't this been good? We actually had somebody on one of our um, social media, media platforms ask us, hey, can we do this? Can we just keep doing it? But you know, sometimes we, like to, we have to change it up and start into something new, so we're excited about the new series that's starting next week, and we'll tell you a little bit about that in just a little bit. So I'm glad that you guys are here, and because we've been talking about relationships, I want to take a quick back look at some of the things that we've talked about. We talk about who we want to ride shotgun with us. And we've talked about people who have been difficult in our lives. We've talked about the megaphone. We've talked about the bubble buster. You guys remember that. And we've got so many people to contend with. And, you know, Tim and I even talked about this this make-believe person, the, the Tim and the Linda called the Tinda. Do you guys remember that? So, so we talk about people that exist and even don't exist here. But what we want to talk about today are some real things that are happening within our lives. And what I want to take a look with you today at is I want to look at an internal perspective from us out, outside, not just a relationship between people, but what we're looking at, what we see in other people. I want to ask this question to you today. How do you respond to the success of someone else? Do you respond negatively or do you respond positively? Or if someone has an amazing talent or a gifting, do you have jealousy and envy or are you truly happy for that person? When we recognize someone for an accomplishment, do we celebrate with them or do we become envious of what has happened in their world? So what we want to start into today is a mindset that we can develop and it becomes kind of competitive at times, a battle within our minds and I call it the comparison game. Has anyone played the comparison game? A couple of you, just you guys and me, nobody else. I think we all, at one time or another, if we're really honest about what's going on inside of our heads, we've played the comparison game. And here's what I've seen in competitive sports, baseball, basketball, rugby, tennis, the purpose of being in competition is to win or lose. A competition involves two willing opponents. The difference between that kind of competition and the comparison game is that the comparison game is only one-sided and you're the only opponent. You're the only one. What we soon find out in the comparison game is that there is never a winner. There is never a winner. The only way to become a winner in the comparison game is when you stop. That's the only time there's a winner. So what we want to do, we want to get started and we want to dive right into some scripture. We're going to look at two scriptures today. So we were going to look at one, and then we're going to bounce to another one. And I want to show you guys the difference between what those two scriptures look like. Read along with me. If you have your Bibles, open those up. If you have a smartphone, if not, we have it right up here on the screen. Let's get started. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight. Say that with me. Strip off every every weight. That slows us down, say that with me, that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. How do we do it? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Say that with me, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Okay, I want you to remember that scripture, and I want you to remember keeping your eyes on Jesus, and hold that thought for just a minute. We're gonna jump over to 1 Samuel 18, six through nine. Tim referenced this a week or so ago, and it's about the King, King Saul meeting up with King David. They've been in a battle together, and that's where they enter this scene. As they arrived, David was returning from a campaign against the Philistines. Women from all of Israel's cities came to meet King Saul. 
They sang and danced, accompanied by tambourines, joyful music, and triangles. They were excited. The women were celebrating, saying, Saul has defeated a thousand, but David has defeated tens of thousands. Saul became angry because he considered this saying to be insulting. To David, they credit tens of thousands, he said, but to me, they credit only a few thousand. The only thing left for David is my kingdom. From that day on, look with me, Saul kept an eye on David. All right. The first verse tells us this. The first one that we looked at, we're running this race. It's the race of life. We're on a journey, and we're trying to stay on this course that God has planned on for us. We're trying to stay strong. We're trying to stay focused, but there are always things, as we know, that will come into our lives and try to slow us down. The scripture says they're actually a weight on top of us. We can begin to get sidetracked and look everywhere except where God wants us to look. But what we know is this, the best way to keep going without getting worn out, the scripture tells us, because we do get worn out, is to strip off those things that slow us down. That makes sense. Strip those off, specifically the sin that entangles us. So how do we do that? It told us in the first verse, by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, staying focused, not being distracted, watching him, following him because we're followers of Jesus, and being guided by him. But the second verse, the one that we looked at secondly about King Saul, tells us this. We can start out with good good intentions, and we change it along the way. And that's what happened to Saul. Let me tell you about Saul for just a minute. Saul was a chosen king. Saul was appointed by God. Saul was the person that God had in place to have the the nation of Israel move forward. He started out as, as a great king, but how many of us know that it's not about how you start out, but it's how you finish? It's not about how you start out. So Saul, he started out really well. And so many of us, we start out really well. We're following God. We are focused on what he wants us to do. And Instead, what Saul did was this. He started, fix, instead of fixing his focus on God, he began to take his focus and get fixated on David. All right? So he became frustrated. He became very upset. He became jealous, and eventually he failed. Why? Because Saul kept his eye on David instead of keeping his eye on God. Today, I want to land on what we're calling comparison. The first point that I want to focus on today for us is this. Listen, these are great things to write down, to keep in your notebook, to put in your phone, to tweet about. These are great things that all of us, that we can all use at one time or another. So these are things that you can write down right now. Comparison is a distraction that will eventually lead to destruction. Comparison is a distraction that can eventually lead to destruction. So here's a distraction. We're looking side to side. We're trying to see what everybody else is doing instead of being focused on what God wants us to do. Looking from side to side, eventually, if I keep looking to the left and the right, I'll eventually trip up, right? I can't stay looking forward and looking side to side at the same time. So here's my story. I go to the gym, and I get on what's called the treadmill. Any of you get on the treadmill? Okay, the treadmill is the easy way of working out, right? So that's what I do. So I get on the treadmill, and I, you know, I set my timer, set my little incline, and I'm, you know, I start out, all is good, focused on the, I'm actually focused on the TV most of the time, it's kind of my time. A person gets on beside me, this girl gets on beside me, and she sets her little timer, puts her incline on, and pretty soon we're walking together, and you know, that's all, what's up? Pretty soon we're in cadence, kind of weird, right, when you get in cadence with somebody else. But then the next thing you know, what she starts to do She starts to increase her incline a little bit. She starts to go a little bit faster. I'm still at the same pace. She's kind of pumping it up a little bit. And what do I do? I'm looking forward, but I'm doing one of these. I'm trying to check out what she's doing. Where is her incline? Why is she going faster? And I start to think, well, maybe I need to do the same thing. And pretty soon, what do I end up doing? I ended up tripping up because I'm trying to watch what somebody else is doing. Why? Why would I do that? Why do we do this? Why do I even care? what she's doing on her treadmill, but we do. We do it, right? The comparison game, I want us to ask ourselves this question. I want you to really think about this right now. Who 
are you keeping your eyes on? Who are you watching? What family do you keep your eye on? Is it somebody on Facebook or on Twitter or Instagram? Is it somebody who's financially successful that you just keep watching what they're doing? Is it somebody who's a great musician or a vocalist who's on the stage? Somebody who has a great marriage or good relationship or somebody who is really, really good looking or beautiful? Who are you keeping your eye on? What I know about comparison is this, is that comparison can become obsessive. It can become destructive. Comparison can take the best of friendships and create enemies. It can distort the truth and cause discord in families. Comparison will make you feel miserable. Have you ever felt miserable from being compared to someone else? It makes you feel feel less worthy, not important, or It'll make you feel superior or above the pack or prideful. Here's another great thing that I want you guys to hear. Comparison will either elevate you above or it will diminish you below. It only has two purposes. It can't be anything any different. You're not on an even playing field when you're comparing with somebody else. So let's take a look at what comparison looks like in our lives. So what I know is this is that comparison has a couple different looks, and one of the comparisons is is that comparison looks like an internal measuring tape. So, I don't always carry carry a measuring tape, but when I do, it's a big one. So, we're going to flip this over. So, comparison is like this internal measuring tape that we keep in our pocket and then we just carry with us, and we hold it wherever we go, and we always measure ourselves in comparison to somebody else. So, what I might do is this, is I might look at the great qualities of somebody else, and I'll look at the deficiencies of myself, and I'll think, I don't measure up. Or I might look at the awesome successes that I've had in my life, and man, they're not, they're kind of weak, they're not doing very well, and then I'll feel like I'm up here. So our internal measuring tape shows us and tells us inside what we think we should be in compared to someone else. And here's what I want you to know today. Neither of those are how God wants us to see ourselves. Neither of those. You see, you know that perfect family that you see with the six children and you know that they get up every morning and they sit around the breakfast table and mom makes eggs and mom makes um, bacon and the kids are just eating so eloquently and after, after the breakfast they clean them up and they put them in the dishwasher for mom. Then they go into their rooms, they make their beds, they get dressed and they look perfect and they skip to school singing, we love mom and dad, we love mom and dad. <laughs> then they come home from school and mom opens the door and dad's there and they sit down at five o'clock and they're eating this amazing dinner and everyone says, mommy, what else can I do for you? And she says, listen, go get your baths and get to bed. It's time to go to sleep. And they go to bed and they sing and they, they pray together and then they start it again the next day. You know that family. <laughs> you know that family. And what you think about yourself is, dang, I can't make it from the house to the car without World War III with my kids, yeah. Right? Or you look at the man or the woman that's successful or the one that's beautiful and we pull out our internal measuring tape and we try to measure who they are compared to who we are. And what I want you to know about that family that looks perfect, they're not. What I want you to know about that person that's financially successful and you think that they're perfect, they're not. And the woman that's beautiful and the man that's good looking, guess what, they have issues. They're not perfect. So what we do is we measure someone's outer awesomeness to our inner insecurities. Don't we do that? Their outer awesomeness to our inner insecurities. You know, I remember the first time that I didn't feel like I measured up. I was a little girl in grade school. We lived in Atlanta, Georgia. There was this little girl. Her name was Georgie. Georgie was petite. She was cute. She had curly blonde hair made great grades, all the teachers loved her, and all the boys adored her, and then there was me. What what are you laughing about? (laughs) Awkwardly tall, right? (laughs) Yep, yeah. (laughs) Pastor, you're awkwardly tall. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Awkwardly tall, gangly, stringy hair, not confident in who I was. So here I was in the very beginning of my years looking at this girl who I thought was up here and I was down here. And for many years, I used that as my measuring tape to think, well, maybe it's that type of girl that's successful. 
Maybe it's that type of girl that succeeds in life, and maybe there's something wrong with me. Honestly, I have to still be careful not to pull out that measuring tape, and I think if we're being honest, we all do. We have to be careful not to pull it out of our back pockets, and and I, I want you to know that it's something that I still struggle with, but here's what I know, and I heard this a while ago, that anything that, that I struggle with, if I use it as a message, I'm never going to be lacking for material, right? <laughs> never going to be lacking for material. Here's what I've realized over the years about myself, and maybe you fit into this category too. My comparison was really never about not wanting to see someone else do well. My comparison was always that their doing well meant that I wasn't. Okay, it wasn't that I wasn't happy for someone else doing well. Somebody else is doing well must mean that I'm not doing well. I'm not as pretty. I'm not as successful. What comparison does is this. It takes our private pandemonium and measures it against someone else's public perfection. We see our crazy life and we compare it to their calm life. We see our jacked up life and we compare it to theirs who we think doesn't have a jacked up life. But we know being in this church long enough, we're all pretty jacked up. That's why we're here. That's why we love TE Church. Galatians 6.4 says this, pay careful attention to your own work. That's so good. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Get that. You won't need to. If you're focused on your own work and you're focused on Jesus, we don't need to compare to other people. Okay, the second thing. This is a trap. Anybody seen a trap? There's actually still fur in the trap, which is really gross. (laughs) So comparison is a trap that will hold you back. So I don't know a lot about traps, as we found out last night in the service. (laughs) But what I know is this about a trap. A trap is set to lure something in it. So if I set this trap over here, The intention is for it to be open, however it's open, or I'm not even sure how it works, but it, it, however it works, there's food put in here, luring something into this trap. So last night I talked about um, luring the squirrel, because we trap squirrels. Well, we don't trap squirrels. I thought we trapped squirrels. I'm like, you put a nut in there and you trap the squirrel. But I found out since then from all the hunters in West Virginia and Ohio, we don't trap squirrels. But what we're going to trap today is we're going to trap a raccoon. So the raccoon has get, gotten into my garbage way too long, way too long. And so I'm going to set a trap. And what I'm going to do with that trap is he's not going to be suspecting it. That's the thing about the trap. The raccoon's walking along. All he's, all he's doing is looking for some food. His focus is on his food. And so when he sees food, he goes into the trap. And what does the trap do? It shuts and it locks them into a place where they could be transported someone else. It's a place where they have not suspected to go or to be. This reminds me of us in the mornings getting up and perusing through Facebook. And we're starting out good and we're unsuspecting because we're just going to check our status and see who's liked our things. And next thing you know, we get caught on and we're looking at this this um, person who, wow, what's going on in their life? Click, click, click. We go in a little bit farther. We go in a little bit deeper until finally we end up comparing our lives to that fictitious, possibly fake Facebook person that we're seeing on there and we're caught in the comparison trap. Here's what you have to hear. If you dare to compare, then beware of the snare. If you dare to compare, beware of the snare. It's not too much longer that it's coming. Our minds can become trapped. Comparative thoughts we can trap. It's so easy to get into this trap, but I want to tell you, when you get into the trap, it's hard to get out. It's not impossible to get out, but it's hard to get out. It's made in that design. If you're not careful, comparison will become easier and easier and easier until it finally becomes a habit. And how do, what do we know about habits? Habits are hard to break. Anybody who has a bad habit, you know it's hard to break that habit. So when the doors open and they swing open and the good-looking woman comes walking down the aisle, how many heads are turning and how many of us women are comparing ourselves to that woman who's walked in the room? Oh, just me, okay. <laughs> or we're in the gym, fellas, and we're p- pumping it up, right? And there's a guy, and he's like, 
totally built. Are you not, like, in some weird way, like, saying, okay, that could be me, right? We have to be careful because it is a trap. Here's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Listen, stay alert, stand tall in the faith, be courageous, and be strong. He means this, be aware, watch. Our eyes are on Jesus. If we get distracted, we'll get into a trap. Does that make sense? Yes, be aware and listen and stand alert. The third thing, comparison is a liar. Comparison is a liar. Comparison only says two things. Comparison says you're not good enough, or comparison says you're better than. Now listen, close. It's not that you are better than and she is worse, or he is better and you are worse. It's just that we are different. We are different. When you start comparing, you start questioning yourself. That's not God's design. You get confused about what God wants to do in and through you. You lose your sense of confidence or you gain more confidence and become prideful. You can become bitter or angry or you can be so up there that you're beyond reproach. Jesus tells us this, that we do have a thief. And the thief has come. His purpose is to come and to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, my purpose is to bring you life and, to, and bring it more abundantly. Now, there's a quote that says this, comparison is the thief of joy. So can't you imagine that the enemy has a field day with stealing our joy from us, from comparison? That's what it says, the thief will come to rob, steal, kill, and destroy you. So if the joy that God has intended you to have, the thief will come and try to take it away from you. He's on the prowl. He's enticing us all of the time to keep us in a place, in a trap setting, and he's lying to us every step of the way. Comparison wants to do this. It wants to steal your joy. Comparison wants to kill your dreams, those of you that are dreamers. Comparison wants to destroy your purpose and the plan that God has for you. If we start comparing, we'll never do anything. I've seen it happen to too many people. I can't do that because she does it like this. I can't do that because he does it like this. We're not comparing, we're, we're not comparing our lives to someone else's. We're always comparing our lives to Jesus. Comparison will turn your contentment into chaos. It will turn it into chaos. So Paul says this, do your own work well then you will be have, have something to be proud of, but don't compare yourself with others. Anybody getting this today? Yeah. It's making sense, okay. As we're winding down, I always wanna give you handles on, now we know what the problem is, now let's figure out how we can do something about it, right? Let's walk out of here with some handles on it and some confidence today. Number one, be grateful. God made you phenomenal. I want you to see how God sees you. He sees you as chosen, as unique, as new, forgiven. He sees you as blessed, free, holy, blameless. He sees you as redeemed. He sees you as a light. He sees you as complete in Christ. He sees you as beautiful. He is loving toward you, and he adores you as one of his children. God made one of you and only one of you. You're amazing. The expression that you bring is unique. It's not like anyone else's. It's unique. You have something that no one else has. Your mind, your voice, your talents, your abilities, your vision, your story, your calling is unique unto only you. Don't miss how phenomenal you are when you start to play the comparison game. Be grateful for who God made you to be. Don't set your eyes on how phenomenal someone else is. Set your eyes on how phenomenal God made you, and that's okay. That's godly confidence in who you are. It's so easy for us to overlook everything that God has made us to be and get so laser-focused on the achievements and talents of someone else. I've done it. I've done it. Someone hear this today. Stop hating yourself for everything you are not and start loving yourself for everything that you are. Start loving yourself for everything that you are. Quit looking at your deficiencies. Don't put this up and say, I'm not this, I'm not this. Look at what you are. There's a lot more that you are than what you're not. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not skinny enough. 
I'm not rich enough. I'm not talented enough. That's a lie straight from the devil. Doubting your self-worth and believing you aren't good enough will make you jealous and bitter and withdrawn. And eventually, mark my words, eventually you'll stop like King Saul did. And here's what I know. You can't stop your expression. You can't do it. We need what you have. Shoot, the world needs what you have. God intended you to be, to be fabulous and wonderful to bring those things to the plate so that we could all be served of that thing that you've been given. Comparison will, compu- com- will certainly confuse. Let me try that. Blah, 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 blah. Let's try it again. <laughs> Confusion or comparison will certainly confuse the certainty of God's call on your life. Comparison will certainly confuse the certainty of God's call on your life. God made you to be you, and we need you to do what only you can do. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss, doesn't it? We need you to do what only you can do. Truly, you're like no other person. Be grateful for who he's made you to be. Psalm 139, it's one of the most beautiful scriptures, in my opinion, in the entire Bible, and it says this, for I am your unique creation, filled with wonder and awe. You have approached even the smallest details in me with excellence, and your works are wonderful. Be grateful and encouraged by who God has made you to be. The second thing, be encouraging. God made others phenomenal too. This is not just a one-woman show or a one-man show. I love this quote. Listen, listen close. A flower doesn't compare itself with the flowers around it. It just blooms. Isn't that good? This is how God designed us to be. Like the flower that can bloom and thrive and be beautiful alongside other flowers who are thriving and being beautiful as well. You see how it works. We come alongside each other. We're all created in his image with differences and talents and giftings, working alongside one another to function as one in the body of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 12. Isn't that a great scripture? It's who we're supposed to be. God designed all of us to lock arms with one another, to admire the accomplishments. Do you admire the accomplishments of people around you? Do you work together? Do you cheer each other on? Do we believe in each other enough to tell them, good job, a boy. Ask yourself that question today. Are you doing that? Because this is what's healthy in the body of Christ. Here's what's not healthy. Seeing someone else doing well, then withholding your encouragement and holding up the measuring tape and comparing my giftings to her giftings, my giftings to his giftings. Hey, we do it in the body of Christ. I've seen it in action. But our church believes in everyone being included in this process. So the healthy church encourages each other, lifts each other up, appreciates the giftings of other people. But let's just pause for just a minute. And I'm going to ask you to be really honest with yourself. Are you standing back and watching? Are you standing back and criticizing? Are you standing back and judging? Or... Are you stepping into it and uplifting? Are you stepping into it and empowering? Are you stepping into it and encouraging other people? Because that is the mark of a follower of Jesus. If we have our eyes focused on him. Remember, remember this. If you take anything away today, remember this. Someone else doing well does not mean that you're not doing well. It just means that they're doing well. And you can do well also. Just because he's a great writer doesn't mean you're not a good writer. Just because she sings like an angel doesn't mean that you sound hideous, unless you're me. Maybe you do sound hideous. Just because they have a great marriage doesn't mean you don't. It just means that we're different people. And wouldn't it be really cool if you saw the person who was a good writer and you want to be a good writer and you said, hey, can I sit down with you for an hour? Could you give me some ideas and some thoughts? Or the person who was a great singer and you really feel called to be a great vocalist, but you know what, you don't have the chops yet. Could you sit down with me and maybe we could get on a mic together and kind of, you could help me out. Or that person, that couple that has a great marriage and you don't, and you know that you don't. And you sit down together and you sit across from the table and you have coffee and say, tell me what makes it work for you. Instead of standing back, push yourself 
into it. Let's celebrate with those who are doing well. Let's celebrate big because the first Thessalonians says this, encourage one another and build each other up. Isn't that so good? And the last thing, be focused, be focused. God has equipped you. You have the giftings and the talents and are equipped for God for everything he's called you to. Now remember, it's what he's called you to. But if you're not succeeding in the things that you wanna do, maybe it's not what God's called you to, and that's between you and God. Set your eyes on Jesus. The first scripture we talked about was setting your eyes on Jesus, not on someone else and not getting distracted. Set your feet on his path and let him guide you. Lastly, be focused on your dreams and ambitions. When we compare, we're giving more attention to the other person's achievements than we are our own. Ask yourself this question, what and who am I focusing on? What are my goals? What do I want my future to look like? What kind of relationships do I want to have with other people? What has God equipped me to do? And what am I striving for to fall under what God has for me? Where your eyes wander, your mind will begin to wonder. When you wander, you begin to wonder and you're not focused. Do you see how it works? It's like common sense, but man, sometimes I think we have to be reminded each time. Stay focused, don't wander. Remember, you have been called to be you and not to be someone else. If you're trying to be who God made someone else to be, you'll miss who God made you today. And I wanna close with this scripture. Make sure that you're doing your very best, for then you will have the personal satisfaction of work well done, and you won't need to compare yourself with someone else. Let's pray together.